Good morning. My name is Robin Mukherjee, and I'm a student at the School of Philosophy and Economic Science. At the age of about, I don't know, 15, 16, quite a young man, I was visiting family on my mother's side in, in a very beautiful, picturesque region of Germany called Taunus. I don't know if anybody knows it, close to Frankfurt am Main. And I remember it fondly as a place of rolling hills and deep forests that you can sort of lose yourself in. We took an excursion to one of those gorgeous little old medieval towns with narrow cobbled streets, fairy tale houses, and the inevitable castle. My memories are a bit hazy here. It was quite a long time ago, but I think the place was called Königstein. So if you if you know it, um, you know, flag it up in the chat. Well, wherever it was, they had a museum, a, a museum that housed at that moment in time an exhibition about a notable. German intellectual poet, scientist, and accomplished municipal administrator called Johann Wolfgang Goethe. It's not clear to me exactly what he might have had to do with Königstein, but he was born nearby, so I guess they could claim him as, as one of their own. And I'm also not sure what I learned about Goethe that day, but I was gifted with a poster which featured a famous portrait of him, which I will share. It's not the poster, but it is the famous portrait. And I kept this on, on my wall for years until I went to university to study law as it happened. And then it was replaced by a picture of Che Guevara. <laughs> but the exchange I wasn't quite so incongruent as one might immediately suppose, as we may discover. Goethe lived through a time of immense upheaval and change. The Seven Years' War, the French Revolution, the American War of Independence, the rise and fall of Napoleon Bonaparte, new science, new literature, new thinking. While his personal life was itself also fairly tumultuous, at least in his early years, as he dropped out of university, went back, failed professionally, and threw himself into the arts. For all the elegance of that image, there's the curious eyes, the gentle smile, that perfectly tied cravat. There was something of the rebel in him, something that wouldn't just accept what he was told, but would question, explore, and challenge. So, obviously, I'm going to talk a bit about this man, Goethe, whose life and work had a huge and lasting impact on literature and science culture, who Napoleon called the boundless measure of a man. I've only got about 12 minutes, but Goethe said, to paraphrase, that the general is the specific case, and the particular is millions of cases. To understand, in other words, the whole, one need only properly consider a particular. So I'm going to consider just a little of his life, and that part of it which might be called Blessed Longing, after one of his poems. He was born in 1749, and from an early age showed a love of reading. He later wrote, and um, we'll quote it because I think it's so delightful, I had from childhood the singular habit of always learning by heart the beginnings of books and the divisions of a work, first of the five books of Moses and then of the Aeneid and Ovid's Metamorphoses. If an ever busy imagination of which that tale may bear witness led me hither and thither, if the medley of fable and history, mythology and religion threatened to bewilder me, I readily fled to those oriental regions, plunged into the first books of Moses, and there amid the scattered shepherd tribes found myself at once in the greatest solitude and the greatest society and the greatest company. And I think that's just a beautiful description of reading. It should be given to every school child, the greatest solitude and the greatest society. But there, were, there it was, the imagination ever busy, the search for experience, for understanding. One might have thought a life in literature beckoned, but his father was a successful lawyer, and it doesn't look as if the young Johan had much to say in the choice of his career. He began his legal, legal studies in Leipzig University, but spent most of the time hanging out with actors, as they say, and poets and artists, attending lectures from other disciplines. He sort of reminds me of me. All of which led to him being, if not the first, at least among the most notable university dropouts, which must have been quite a breach for a young man from a respectable family. One gets the impression that there was some resistance to the path laid out for him, but maybe not enough resistance, or at least not sufficiently effective resistance, because he was dispatched once he was well enough to Strasbourg to complete his education. When he got to Strasbourg, he noticed its cathedral. You can't help notice the cathedral in Strasbourg in all its Gothic glory, a style of architecture disapproved of in the Enlightenment aesthetic as ill-proportioned, rustic, 
unfinished, failing to conform to the clarity, the certainties of the classical measure, the formal line, and he loved it for all those reasons. And it drove his participation in an artistic movement, which was influential, short-lived, but influential, called Sturm und Drang, Storm and Stress. So this was 18th century punk, or at least angry young men rebelling against the constraints of rules. The well-made play, for instance, constructed to supposed Aristotelian unities, art as edification, music as a mathematical discourse. Goethe and his friends loved the unpredictability of art, its sense of unconstraint, of genius to which the old rules don't apply. They loved Shakespeare, who didn't take any notice of the dramatic unities. They loved him for the passion, his acknowledgement of life's troubles, his immersion into the psyche, the soul of his characters, not to define or explain the human predicament or to wag a finger of moral censure, but to wonder at it in all its aspects. He qualified as a lawyer, but he was so bad at it that he lost all his cases. Well, uh, perhaps not bad, but he approached it unconventionally, which didn't really fly within the existing system. But still, by that time, he'd written the book, an epistolary novel called The Sorrows of Young Werther. It was a worldwide success. It brought him fame, a measure of wealth, and his father's acknowledgement that maybe the law career wasn't for him after all. N Napoleon, obviously a fan, read it apparently seven times or claimed to. And Goethe was invited to take up a role in the court of the minor fiefdom of Weimar as counsel to the young duke in charge of local mining, among other things, parks and recreation, the art department and other various administrative responsibilities. So the study of law actually probably came in handy then. And I'm not sure if his father ever said, I told you so. But that's where he stayed, mostly for the rest of his life. He had one other excursion early on in these Weimar days when he upped sticks and just ran off essentially to Italy, which he traveled for two years. It was by all accounts, a wonderful, a transformative experience. He forgave classicism its formality, but only, only after he'd seen it for himself as something beautiful and fresh and exciting rather than as a I don't know, collection of dead things to be controlled by those who owned the past. There are two lovely passages from his journals of the time. Think of this exuberant young man, a romantic at heart, full of enthusiasm, finding himself abroad in Italy at that time, of all places, with its antiquity and elegance, culture, architecture, landscape, and, and of course, sunshine. So, ah, here we go. Um, slide. Ah, yes. Here we are, overwhelmed and overcome. Wherever you walk or stand, you are confronted by a landscape of various kinds, palaces and ruins, gardens and wildernesses, distant prospects and intimate foregrounds, houses, stables, triumphal arches and columns, often all of them in such proximity that it could all be captured on one sheet of paper. One would have to use thousands of slate pencils. One pen would not do it. And then by evening, one is tired and exhausted from all that looking and marveling. So there's a clue about the nature of his transformation. In that last sentence, looking and marveling, you could say that this is what he discovered, to observe and to consider, to wonder, to inquire, to contemplate. It's a lovely word, to marvel. When he got back to Germany, he renounced Sturm und Drang, along with Romanticism as a movement. It's not that he lurched <coughs> towards the Enlightenment. He was still deeply critical, famously critical, of Newton, Newtonian physics. And he didn't really embrace clerical theism, but he had discovered how to look and how to, to use his word marble. Still in Italy, um, he wrote with boyish enthusiasm, if I can say, I turn with my narrative to the sea again, where I today saw sea snails, shellfish and crabs and took great delight in their world. What a lovely thing, it's a living creature, how tuned to its condition, how true, how full of being. How greatly do I profit from my modest study of nature and how fervently do I long to continue it? He spent the rest of his life in Weimar. It wasn't without incident. He fought in war, had his house ransacked by French soldiers while he was in it. His wife stood up to them. Um, but, you know, apart from those incidents, uh, it was a fairly quiet life. But he was no longer this tragic figure of the forlorn poet, the young Werther, this fictional doppelganger melancholy to the point of self-destruction. He had a purpose. His longing for knowledge for something greater that couldn't be explained through ecclesiastical or enlightenment doctrine found its method in the simple observation of the world around him. And he lost no opportunity 
As the official in charge of mining, he noticed things about rocks that were influential on the development of geology. Since the Royal Parks came within his remit, he came up with startling and delightful new botanical theories. In charge of the art college, he noticed an anatomical detail in the human form that helped to lay the foundations of the theory of evolution. Primarily, he saw men not outside nature, but of it, which was a crucial distinction from some religious orthodoxy at the time. Whatever he engaged with, he questioned, looking for the founding principle, the primary structure. He likened it to Ariadne's thread, guiding through the labyrinth of form to its center. And he actually created the science of morphology, the science of form. Alongside his scientific meditations, there were, of course, the literary. And it's difficult to identify which might be his most significant legacy. Within his voluminous body of writings, there's a poem with a tri title translated variously, but uh, let's take Blessed Longing. It's about yearning for more. More what? Insight, understanding, depth of experience, breadth of experience, authenticity, reality. In the poem, Goethe writes about a Schmetterling, which is one of those German words that are a pleasure to say, Schmetterling. It means butterfly, although the word moth is also used in translation and actually seems a bit more accurate. In fact, he writes to the Schmetterling, he addresses it, saying that he admires, as most people wouldn't, the moth's fascination with the flame. The flame, after all, is the destruction of the moth. But the moth has already experienced destruction and reconstitution, grub to pupae to winged creature. But still, that longing which brings it to the fire. Werther, in that original story, destroyed himself in a way that Goethe later regretted because it was just the end. For the Schmetterling, the metaphor is one of constant evolution. Goethe spoke elsewhere of analysis and synthesis, using observation and contemplation to inquire into the cause of a thing and then recognizing the existence of that cause in the object. Everything he wrote that exists is an analogy for the whole of existence. After all, who can comprehend the whole of existence? But we can apprehend a crab <coughs> in a rock pool, and our consideration of that can lead us to the whole. Elsewhere, he wrote, here we go, the true, which is identical with the divine, can never be directly apprehended by us. We see it only in its reflections, in examples, symbols, in specific and related phenomena. We register it as incomprehensible life, yet we cannot renounce the wish to get hold of it fully. The schmetterling within us, this longing to understand, the yearning for a complete experience, the dissatisfaction with the mundane is in that last phrase, the wish to get hold of it fully. Following the metaphor, it requires us to give up what we think we know, the ordinary view, the unexamined perception to find the greater again and again, and having found the deeper through analysis to understand how the cause creates the effect, how the unified underlies the multiplicity, the general, the specific. This process of reflection, he says, takes place the moment we observe. Every act of looking becomes observation. Every act of observing becomes contemplation. Every contemplation is an act of connecting. Hence, one can say that with every attentive glance at the world, we are already theorizing. By theorizing, we're beginning to reflect, to understand. And if you don't engage with this process of a metaphorical death and renewal, then you are condemned, he says, in the final lines of the poem, to be a gloomy guest in Earth's darkened room. Goethe is often referred to as a polymath, someone who knows something of everything. And he was actually remarkably able, as we've seen, and diverse in his interests. But to some extent, perhaps even to a great extent, he was mostly concerned with the singular question of what is. Later in life, he wrote, what applies to all my works, and hence even to the smaller poems, is the fact that they all, triggered by occasions of greater or lesser importance, were composed in the act of immediate contemplation of one object or another. For this reason, they're all different, and yet they have in that in, they have in common that, in the context of these particular external and often ordinary circumstances, something general, inward, higher, hovered before the mind's eye of the poet. So this immediate contemplation, and then the ordinary, that something general, inward, 
hovering before the mind's eye of the poet. So that's a little about Goethe. As with any great life or great subject, there are diverse opinions. And I've taken really a very brief glance at an extraordinary body of work. I hope you enjoyed it, found it useful. Philosophy Live is here every Friday morning. Thank you very much for coming along for your company, your society. Do enjoy the rest of the day and the weekend when it comes. Thank you. So I'm just enjoying your comments for a moment. Thank you very much. Great. Well, again, thanks for your company. I'll close now and uh, you can add your comments to, um, to the feed uh, later. Cheerio.